Okay, well, we are at 1230 Eastern um, and right at our start time. So I think um, in honor of everybody's time, we'll go ahead and get started on time. My name is Erin Robinson. I'm the Executive Director of ESIP, the Earth Science Information Partners. And I'd like to welcome you to this webinar on measuring and assessing the socioeconomic value of earth science data. It's the third in a series of webinars that we're doing. And um, if you were just joining, you heard that it is recorded. Um, and those past webinars are found on YouTube and we'll share the links a little bit later. So this webinar is gonna be moderated by Dr. Jay Perlman. Jay is the director of Four Bridges, a nonprofit research organization, and his background includes sensors, remote sensing, and information systems. Um, and he's had, I think, a strong interest in the socioeconomic value of Earth observations for quite a while. Um, and so I'm, I'm delighted that he's here and he's been participating in this webinar series and the planning of the whole series with his wife, Francois. Um, and he's gonna be the moderator. So Jay, I will turn it over to you and I will start the slides. Thank you, Erin, and I'd like to welcome all of the participants to the webinar on socioeconomic value of our science data, as Erin did. We have a very, very nice program for you today uh, with three speakers. Um, the speakers are Yusuke Kuwayama, Robert Downs, and Miriam Morambadoro. I'd like to give background, if we could go back one slide, to the webinar as a whole. This is part of a series on socioeconomic value of earth science data information and applications based on a decade of work that's been done under the GeoValue community. We look to explore approaches and techniques that are being used to measure and assess socioeconomic value. And by doing that, we're looking at how decisions are made, the basis of decisions, and the impact of those decisions. These methods that we're using are invaluable for demonstrating the return on investment of data products and information systems. And so we look to this as an opportunity to bring you into a process that we've been developing with the GeoValue community. The structure for the webinar is there will be three presentations. We would like to encourage you to enter questions as you're going along in the chat box, and we'll have time at the end of the session today to discuss your questions and answer them. With that, let's move forward to the first of the presentations. Can we go to the slide for Yusuke? Very good. Yusuke will be giving a presentation on quantifying the socioeconomic benefits of Earth observations and decision making. Yusuke has uh, been working in this community for quite a while and is a fellow at the Resources for the future. It's a group in Washington, DC, and he's director of socioeconomic studies for the Consortium for Valuation of Applications and Benefits Linked with the Earth Science Community and their activities. It's called Valuables. And this is a cooperative agreement between RFF and NASA in terms of research, outreach, and also communications relating to socioeconomic value and impacts. Dr. Kuyama's research focuses on the economics of water resource management and also on the value of earth science information. Let's welcome Dr. Kuyama and I turn it over to you, Yusuke, for the presentation. Thank you very much, Jay, for that introduction and, and thank you and to Francois for um, uh, having me at this uh, webinar today, as well as to Aaron and Isip. Um, it is uh, a pleasure to be speaking today about uh, the socioeconomic benefits of Earth observations, uh, specifically in, in the framework that uh, the Valuables Consortium, the, the cooperative agreement with, uh, between RFF and NASA that Jay mentioned, um, views, uh, views these benefits. 
Um, so let's uh, jump right in. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just a quick overview of the Valuables Consortium. Um, you can think of the consortium as uh, having two main categories of activities. The first category consists of generating uh, new studies uh, that uh, provide uh, quantitative estimates of the value of uh, satellite-based data um, in specific decision-making contexts. Um, and so we are basically trying to add to the um, body of evidence that documents that uh, the investments made in satellite data uh, lead to tangible benefits to society. So we're adding to the literature in some sense uh, in one set of activities. And the other set is a capacity building set of activities in which uh, we are working with the earth science community to increase the familiarity with the concepts, terms, and methods associated with uh, impact assessment, which is the name we give to these kinds of studies that document uh, the value, the socioeconomic value of uh, satellite-based uh, applications. Um, and uh, we are developing a, uh, a community, an interdisciplinary community of social scientists and earth scientists uh, in order to conduct this work. Um, next slide, please. So um, there are several, um, I want to start basically by um, describing why we ought to um, place a value on Earth observations, and in particular, follow what uh, in our consortium we call the value of information approach, which I will uh, describe in more detail later. Um, Aaron, uh, I have these uh, bullet points appearing. Um, you can kind of scroll through. There should be four. Yeah, we can just do them all at once. Yep, that's it. Thanks. Um, so, you know, four reasons that we uh, bring forth uh, to uh, argue that uh, it is important to place a value on Earth observations. First, uh, to demonstrate return on investment in satellites and data products. So we know that these investments cost money um, and it is important to document uh, in turn what the benefits are uh, of uh, these investments to society. In addition, uh, we believe that uh, evaluation of Earth observations provides Earth scientists with an effective tool for communicating the value of their work uh, in socioeconomically meaningful terms, which uh, is a term I'll uh, uh, define in a bit, um, but it, it can uh, qu quantification of these values can serve as a, um, a communication tool in itself. We also believe that um, the valuation of Earth observations across uh, different applications can allow um, organizations to make more informed choices about how to invest limited resources in different types of uh, applications, uh, given that they may yield different levels of societal benefit. And so in order to uh, assess uh, what these trade-offs are, uh, we need the quantification of the benefits. And then finally, uh, and this is a bit more of a subtle point, uh, we believe that understanding how a satellite or satellite data application generates socioeconomic benefits, that understanding in itself can improve the uh, success of these projects uh, by um, requiring uh, these research teams to uh, justify right, the, the causal link, to defend the causal link between the information that they're producing and the socioeconomic benefits uh, that they expect to generate by producing that information. Uh, so next slide, please. And so, you know, before we get into, you know, how we think about quantifying the value of information, we think it's important to define what we mean by value. And in the context of our consortium, uh, we seek to uh, quantify improvements in what we call socioeconomically meaningful outcomes. Um, and I want to be careful here. We, we aren't saying that the only kinds of value generated by information are these, you know, what we call socioeconomically meaningful outcomes. There are uh, other kinds of uh, values that science and research places on information. And our consortium happens to be focused on what we call socioeconomic and meaningful outcomes. And so what are these socioeconomic and meaningful outcomes? In short, one uh, outcomes that matter to people and to the environment. Right, so these need to be outcomes uh, that people care about or that are linked to the environment. And some examples are numbers of lives saved, uh, percent increase in firm profits, acres of forest conserved, 
percent increase in crop yields. Um, so to the extent that we can link these kinds of outcomes to the availability of uh, certain types of information uh, that uh, we believe is, is uh, the aim of our consortium. Uh, so next slide, please. And so how do we do that? Uh, how do we link information, the availability information to socioeconomically meaningful outcomes? We need to identify a theory of change. And this is the basic approach that's tied to every single one of the studies that we're conducting uh, within, the, uh, within the Valuables Consortium. And identifying a theory of change, uh, and by theory of change, we basically mean that the causal link between the availability of a piece of information and the outcome that that availability changes in society. We identify that by uh, following this uh, flowchart that I have here. Um, they, and so let me start with a first row of um, kind of reddish boxes. Here, we are trying to characterize how what the existing information is. Okay, So in the absence of a new uh, satellite data product that we're trying to evaluate, for example, what is the information that's currently being used to make a decision? And what are the actions that a decision maker takes in response to this information? And then we want to link that to the outcomes that those decisions are tied to that matter to people in the environment. And we repeat that exercise, but instead of um, going through the scenario using the existing information, we use the new information, the information that we are trying to assess the value of. Uh, we have to follow the same exercise in which we need to identify what actions are taken using the new information by the decision maker, and this could potentially be a different action from what was taken using the existing information, and then identify the outcomes for the people and the environment uh, that result from those actions taken in response to the new information. And these outcomes may or may not differ from the outcomes that uh, occur when existing information is used to make the decisions. The VOI, the value of information, or the impact of the information is uh, defined as the difference in the value of these two outcomes. And that we represent in the last line here by taking the difference in the outcomes achieved under decision-making with the new information and the outcomes achieved under decision-making with the existing information. So it's a comparison of with and without. Next slide, please. And uh, Aaron, how much time do I have left? Um, I think about like three to five minutes. All right. Uh, so thank you, Aaron. Uh, so I have a, a few examples here, and maybe I won't go through all of them in the interest of time. Uh, these examples are uh, examples of existing and ongoing studies uh, of the type that I mentioned, these impact assessments that uh, seek to uh, provide a quantitative estimate of the value of a given piece of information. This is a study conducted by Isaac Morrison and his co-authors at MSI International. And the tool that they uh, are trying to evaluate, the information that they're trying to value is a tool that provides 72-hour warnings for frost events. And this is a tool that was developed under the SEVERE program within NASA. And in order to understand what the impact of this tool is, um, they conducted a survey of Kenyan tea farmers. So these are the decision makers that we referred to in the flowchart uh, in the previous slide. And then in, in part, through the survey, they discovered what uh, actions are available to these farmers. Um, in response to this new information, which is the 72-hour warning for frost events. And they identified that uh, farmers, in response to uh, advanced warnings of frost events, could harvest uh, their uh, tea leaves early um, before the frost hits, or they could undertake a, a form of light pruning, which makes the uh, tea plants uh, less susceptible to the frost and uh, make them more likely to recover quickly after the frost event. And so these are actions that uh, would not uh, the farmers wouldn't have uh, available to them if it weren't for the 72-hour uh, uh, frost warning. Um, and so you know this is where you see clearly see how this particular study is linked to that flowchart. Right, we have identified the information, the decision makers, and the actions taken by the decision maker, and the last part is the outcome, which uh, the survey also identified as being the annual value of reduced frost damage losses of equivalent to uh, about $81 uh, 
which in this context is, is quite a bit of uh, money. It's equivalent to 25 days of household food spending. So that is the socioeconomically meaningful outcome uh, that we refer to that uh, has uh, taken place as a result of the availability of this information. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I'll, I'll wrap up with this example. Uh, this uh, other impact assessment uh, basically asks, what are the value of Landsat imagery in the gold mining sector? This is a paper by Abhishek Nagarj from the Haas School of Business at uh, UC Berkeley. A really nice study um, where uh, the, the, the new information is Landsat imagery. The decision maker is uh, just individuals and organizations within the gold mining sector. And the actions are uh, consist of where to target uh, discovery of new depo uh, gold deposits. And this uh, study uh, used this very clever methodology where they um, uh, exploited, uh, you know, what economists call a natural experiment, uh, basically looking at periods of time and regions in which Landsat imagery happened to not be available due to technical difficulties and looked at outcomes in those situations when Landsat imagery happened to not be available to those uh, outcomes in the gold mining sector when Landsat imagery was available. And they identified uh, this outcome, which is that regions mapped by Landsat were almost twice as likely to report the discovery of new gold deposits um, thanks to uh, Landsat relative to uh, regions and periods in which Landsat wasn't available. Um, and this could be translated into uh, a monetary value of about $6.4 billion for a country the size of the United States. Next slide, please. This is, uh, I'll skip this uh, example. It's an ongoing study within the Valuables Consortium, and it looks at the value of satellite data for air quality monitoring. Um, and yeah, uh, this is uh, my last slide here. If uh, anybody is interested in learning more about our work, either the research or the capacity building components of it, uh, please visit us at uh, www.rff.org slash valuables. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yusuke. I might add that the Valuables is a multi-year project and will be continuing. So dialogue with Yusuke is very valuable in terms of both getting benefits and, and also helping with suggestions for the project. We'll have time to answer questions about his presentation uh, at the end of the three presentations. I would like to now introduce Dr. Robert Downs. Um, Bob is the senior digital archivist and also acting head of cyber infrastructure and informatics research and development at CSEN, which is the Center for International Earth Science Information Network. He also has been active in uh, GEO and GEOS uh, in terms of leadership and services for the Core Trust Steel Standards and Certification Board, and also working with the repository platforms for research data interest group and data versioning with RDA. So Bob's been active uh, in many areas of uh, these activities. And we're very fortunate to have him to give a presentation now on NASA socioeconomic data and basically approaches for assessing the value of integrated geospatial data products and services. Bob, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Jay. And also thank you, Francois and Aaron for putting all this together for us. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about approaches that we've been using to assess the value of integrated geospatial data products and services at the NASA Socioeconomic Data and Application Center, which I'll just refer to as CDAC. Next slide, please. So uh, we've been doing various assessments of citations of the data products and services at, at CDAC. And, uh, so I'm going to get right into that. Uh, next slide, please. So I find it useful to look at the relationships between the societal value and the scientific value and the socioeconomic value. And I also see that uh, these are uh, the scientific value and the socioeconomic value both overlap 
and they're both part of the society of value. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of the scientific value, we can associate that with the use for uh, testing uh, various aspects of uh, uh, the data, the hypotheses that we're investigating, uh, making comparisons, et cetera. And also it's valuable for specific disciplines or uh, moving out to a variety of disciplines and levels of expertise as well. Uh, there is value uh, to the data curators and distributors as well, and uh, the uh, relative use of specific data products, services, or collections can be compared. So we can start to look at uh, the use of, of a particular product and uh, how uh, we might uh, uh, use that to inform our decision making. Uh, scientific contributions uh, of the collection teams, data curators, and the data stewards also can be recognized. And this is part of the scientific value. In terms of socioeconomic value, uh, we can see the potential downstream adoption for various applications or products, et cetera. Uh, but uh, they're not always discoverable uh, if they're uh, parts of, say, trade secrets uh, of companies. And uh, for societal value, uh, we see the demonstrated adoption uh, in that could inform the public about current or past conditions, as well as some future projections. And uh, decision makers also can use the uh, data for planning and uh, developing their policies and guidelines. Next slide, please. My perspective is that the value of the data depends on use. That is, uh, we see value from the initial use of the data. That is the uh, uh, data producing team uh, has produced their methods and findings and they're gonna share those often uh, within uh, their own community. And that's going to increase the knowledge uh, within those fields that are represented by those uh, members. But uh, we also see enduring value that can come from continuing use of the data. So there can be subsequent studies with uh, new analyses and findings, and the data can be integrated with other data products and services to create new data products and services. And uh, there's a potential for contributing to knowledge across various disciplines, and also increasing understanding across society. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, in terms of measuring the data use to assess the value, uh, we can look at observed data use uh, and that uh, can be uh, measured by uh, you know, page hits and uh, uh, visits, uh, also downloads and uh, the data services that have been used or the websites that are redistributing data products and services. But there are some limitations in that uh, some of the uses, we don't know what those are. Uh, uh, that is, if people are, are using the data uh, to make important decisions, uh, uh, we have no idea, uh, versus uh, somebody who's just stopping by and, and browsing, uh, per se. Um, so a lot of the critical uh, uses can be missed. Um, also, the web hits can be distorted if, uh, People are, are counting the bots uh, that uh, hit a particular site, uh, et cetera. The published reports of data use, uh, they serve as evidence, uh, and we can see them in scientific peer-reviewed journals uh, and uh, uh, books, book chapters, uh, also in alternative uh, um, uh, metrics, uh, uh, you know, blogs, et cetera, uh, tweets, and uh, as well as in the popular media. Uh, but uh, here the data citations might not correctly appear or um, they might not be reported. Uh, next slide, please. So there are some limitations of linking the value to data citations. Uh, they don't necessarily uh, reflect usefulness if we're just looking at aggregated data citations. And we don't necessarily know 
the type or quality of the use that was uh, uh, in the, uh, 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 reflected by the, the citation. So uh, that uh, we'd have to actually look at the narrative to, to determine. And the data citations do not necessarily reflect all the uses out there. And uh, uh, if they're not, uh, the authors aren't providing uh, data uh, attribution, then uh, we're not going to know that the data have been used for those purposes. And then uh, depending on the behavior of the authors, they might uh, be citing the original journal article, but not citing the data. And, and so uh, this can skew things a bit. And then there's the improper or inconsistent data citation pra uh, practices. So for example, some authors don't uh, necessarily put uh, their data citations in the references section, or it might end up uh, somewhere else, uh, like the supplemental information. And the attribution might not necessarily reflect the downstream uses of the data. Uh, the uh, citations can obscure the use of uh, input data if the data have been put together into a, uh, a single product from many data sets. Uh, and plus, uh, we don't necessarily see uh, the uh, actual commercial decision making uh, uh, that's taken place in many cases or government decision making. Some governments might decide that uh, uh, their, their information is uh, for them and uh, their sources are, are not going to be shared. Uh, commercial organizations might consider uh, the use of a particular uh, data product as proprietary or a trade secret for that matter. Next slide, please. So thinking about a couple of, uh, a few different use cases here, we can look at the uh, team of data collection planners and they might want to identify whether similar data products have been collected uh, and how those have been used and that can inform their data collection planning. A data center uh, can look at the citations to determine uh, whether uh, similar uh, uh, data products of that collection uh, have been used and how they have been used and that can inform their collection development. And then uh, a team that's uh, looking at uh, uh, producing new data products, uh, they might uh, uh, look to see how the candidate data sets, uh, uh, whether they've been used for studies that are similar to their plan study. Uh, next slide, please. So, at CDAC, uh, we try to encourage people to cite our data and we uh, have the data citation, a recommended data citation on the landing page, the documentation, and the metadata, as well as providing a DOI with, that, with the, each data citation recommendation. And uh, we also assign open licenses to these so that uh, we're encouraging people to use them. Uh, and others to, to use them uh, based on just seeing a citation. And then um, we provide guidance for authors on how they might uh, cite CDEC data products and services. Once the data is cited, we receive citation alerts from uh, publishers and bibliographic uh, bibliometric databases. And uh, uh, also we, we, uh, we receive alerts from uh, Google Scholar on uh, DOIs of CDEC data. And some authors actually inform us that they've cited our data products, which is great. We review these and uh, we uh, uh, create a, a database record and uh, we're uh, capturing various fields such as publication type, authors, uh, collection, et cetera. Next slide, please. So, when we find citations of CDAC and remote sensing data, we're uh, looking at these articles more closely uh, to look for instances of uh, remote sensing uh, mentioned. And then we're verifying the, the use of the uh, remote sensing data. And in some cases, it's, it's very uh, obvious uh, that no satellite imagery was used and then we discard those. Uh, or if uh, they mention an instrument or 
our satellite imagery without any data use reported, uh, we don't necessarily con uh, consider that uh, citing remote sensing data, and um, uh, we wouldn't count that either. Next slide, please. And Bob, this is just a two-minute warning, too. Great, thank you. So yep. um, the uh, approach that we use uh, for looking at uh, CDEC data and remote sensing data uh, more precisely, and we did a pilot study in this way, is uh, we actually uh, conducted content analysis of 49 papers in 2012, and then we created a taxonomy, which you see there on the, on the right, uh, for analyzing those. Uh, next slide, please. And then we also uh, created a, a, uh, conducted a bunch of studies looking at the interdisciplinary use of, uh, of CDAC data. And here we use the Web of Science uh, uh, category assignments, their subject classification, classifications, and their equivalent uh, general uh, categories uh, in the major fields. And then uh, we paired those with the Web of Science category uh, uh, classifications and uh, the subjects and major fields and normalize those. And so from that, we identified the category subjects and major, major fields of the journals. Next slide, please. So here you see the CDEC citations database, which is publicly accessible. And uh, anybody can go and, and search uh, here at this URL and uh, look at uh, citations for a particular year various uh, publication types, books, journal articles, et cetera, or look at uh, particular uh, data collections and data sets uh, in terms of the citations and do analysis on those. They can uh, uh, get their results on the screen or get them uh, in a downloaded uh, uh, spreadsheet. Next slide, please. And finally, I just thought I would show you uh, some results here. So. Uh, here we had looked at uh, journal articles that had cited uh, both CDAC data and remote sensing data for a 10-year period. And you can see here there were uh, a variety of, uh, of, of different uh, subject areas that are, uh, are using CDAC data and citing them. Uh, some of them are obvious, like environmental sciences and ecology, but some you wouldn't necessarily expect uh, such as uh, public, environmental, occupational health, and the life sciences. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. That was uh, very interesting and certainly relevant to the scientific community and its use of data. Um, there'll be opportunities to ask questions of Bob uh, at the end of the presentations. I'd like to turn next to the third presentation which is by uh, Miriam Moram Badoro. Uh, it's on quantitative methods to assess the value of climate information to users at community level. Uh, Miriam is uh, with the CSIR, the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research in South Africa, and is focused on environmental social science and its sustainability for uh, both science and resource economics. She's been doing some very interesting work uh, in the communities where she's using facilitated stakeholder engagement and capacity building approaches to understand stakeholders and to incorporate their values in the knowledge production and project implementation. So she's working at the interface between human and nature. I'd like to turn it over to Miriam now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. And thank you, Francois and Erin, for organizing this and for inviting me to take part. Um, as I've been introduced, I'm an environmental social scientist, and my work for, uh, focuses mostly on uh, trying to understand uh, how uh, the humans understand different environmental issues and also capacity building and stakeholder engagement to ensure that you know or science information like climate change 
is understood and valued and at local at local level, especially at local government level. That's where most of my research has been uh, focused on. Next slide, please. So in uh, developing countries such as South Africa, climate change uh, is one of their big issues that, and one of the things that have got the potential to derail social economic development, considering that there is competing demands for social and service delivery. Uh, and there's also the need to actually start integrating climate change into development planning. And there is uh, serious, uh, an uh, uneven distribution of uh, risk and wealth within uh, countries such as South Africa. And climate change is mostly felt at the local level where local authorities usually don't have the capacity to actually respond to these uh, challenges. And when from the research that we have done, we've actually found that local government officials ne do not necessarily know what to do, but at times they have uh, conflicting uh, information sources that are available that had at their disposal, some of which does not necessarily uh, originate from the scientific elite. Next slide, please. So uh, local government authorities, for example, have also experienced climate change. And to actually get an understanding of how they've experienced climate change or their perceptions of climate change, I've been using qualitative research to actually try and get an understanding of the local experiences and perceptions, which actually help understand the value that they place on uh, uh, things such as um, climate change and the information that comes from the scientific uh, domain, uh, which, does not which does not always um, align well with the uh, experiences and perceptions. Next slide, please. So from the work that we've been doing, there's uh, a number of sources of information that people have at uh, local government level. For example, there is the South African Risk and Vulnerability Atlas, where millions of uh, uh, runs have been poured into producing uh, climate change information. And there's also work being done by the University of Cape Town through the CSEG. And we also have the South African Weather Services also producing information and disseminating it to communities uh, through radio and television. And so this information sources mostly depend, uh, uh, use uh, your science, scientific information. And uh, at local government, I mean, at local level, uh, people have, you know, um, experiential uh, meditated uh, sources of information. And so understanding how people perceive, uh, perceive information or perceive a particular subject such as climate change would help influence the decisions that they make, whether they are more proactive or reactive to things like climate change. And uh, it also helps us understand how people react when new information is provided because individuals, uh, they have People, I mean, people working at the local level have individual as well as group values. So people, people working in, 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 a, in a setting such as a local government official, in a local government setting, they would have the individual uh, values which are uh, influenced by the experiences of things like climate change. So people, people would share, we're using participatory methods, people would actually share how they've experienced climate change, how the weather has changed from, when the time, from the time when they were growing up. So for them, it's also not necessarily about climate, but it's about the variations that have occurred in weather. And uh, some of those do not always align with, you know, some of the projections or some of the historical uh, stuff that you would find in the scientific domain. Next slide, please. So in my research, I use mostly participatory approaches whereby I use uh, different methods including uh, focus group discussions to actually interact with communities or local government officials to get an understanding of a particular topic. So for example, with climate change, I've had to engage with uh, local government officials to actually get them to share how they've experienced climate change, whether or not they perceive climate change to be an immediate or a future risk. And th those rich discussions that emanate from there would actually help 
one understands the value that they place on information that is new in when, or new information that is brought from the scientific domain. Next slide, please. Another method that one can use actually get some of this rich information is an in-depth in interview where one can actually probe uh, the, the, a participant for information. So for example, one could be asked, what do you perceive to the most effective source of climate change information? From there, one is an open-ended question that allows one to actually identify the different sources of information and the value that they place on the different um, uh, sources of information, of, of, of information. And from my study, the recent study that I've been working on, I found that even though people place value on um, the, uh, scientific uh, information, so the projections that are brought to them by scientists from institutions such as the CSIR, they also have issues around trust when someone is not from within their particular locality and is bringing information on things that are seem distant. So you've got projections that are talking about, you know, things that will happen until, uh, like in 2100. For most people, they actually think it's not going to happen now. So why should we worry now? So those perceptions now uh, determine the value, I mean, the value that they place on that kind of information and the decisions that they take on whether to react or not. Next slide, please. One other method that I also use for uh, during a participatory process just to validate some, some of the information that should get it would actually link to some of the stuff that Rob was talking about. Actually do content analysis to look at the different reports that people have and try and identify how many of them are actually even mentioning climate change in their planning documents. So that would actually help one identify, I mean, uh, assess whether climate change is actually something that is of importance to them. Next slide, please. So uh, from the work that I've been doing, I've actually just included here yeah, some in, uh, some quotes that I found interesting in some of the work that I've been doing. So from a workshop, one of the participants actually said, most officials just want to deal with immediate problems that have immediate benefits and recognition. So climate change seems distant to many people because the projections talk of changes that are open in rainfall and temperatures for time scales beyond our current lifetime. So you can actually tell that the, the value that one would place in that kind of information is some, they would actually regard the information that is, the projections that are presented to them as something that is not really agent. So they don't have much value uh, attached to this kind of information. And in another, in, in an interview with uh, one of the participants, they actually identified um, municipal reports as one of the most important information sources for, when, for climate change adaptation at local government level. And uh, in another uh, uh, quote from, from an interview, one, act, one participant actually said, most of the aid science is not communicated in a way that would convince people to change by demonstrating how what you are recommending actually works. So there is that um, issue of you know, trust, whether this information can be trusted because you can't demonstrate that you know, in 2050, this is how the weather is going to be like, other than, you know, the simulations that one could actually see. And for most people, they don't really relate to that. Next slide, please. Mary, we have about a minute left. Sorry? Oh, a minute. All right. So let me, maybe let's just skip to the last slide then on... Um, on my conclusion. So what I've actually found that is, is that there is different uh, values that people place on, on information, on scientific information, such as climate change information. And there are many conflicting perceptions of risk, which also allude to the different values that people would place on uh, earth science information. And for many people in the non-scientific non -scientific community, they learn about climate change from different sources which do not necessarily emanate from the scientific community. And so the uptake of earth science information is constrained by the dominant conceptualizations of climate change, which focus on its physicality, whereas climate change is also a social phenomenon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miriam. I think the work that you're doing is, is fascinating and 
shows us that the needs for socioeconomic valuations is, is quite broad in, in, on all scales, both um, economic and, and socio matters. Uh, we've gone through in the three presentations methods for evaluation from use of case presentation and also looking at particular case studies. And then uh, Bob Downs gave us uh, a view of how do you assess things and, and focused on literature and data use. And then Miriam came back to summarize engagement of the community and the community perceptions. So we've seen three different aspects of what is the important problem of bringing data to decision makers and then ultimately to the community. I'd like to open the floor now for questions. If you could type your questions into the chat box, we'll use those to um, pose to the panelists. The and Jay, um, you had put a couple in the chat um, and Bill Tang also had one in the chat um, if you want a few to get started. Thank you. Um, I have those and I have some additional ones uh, Aaron, which we will start with. Um, good. So uh, let's talk about uh, in the first question we had, um, Yusuke, you, okay, you talked about the frost warning case, which was intriguing. And you talked about the value of the savings to an individual farmer. Could you also talk about the breadth of adoption, that is how many farmers took it up and what's the value to the regional community beyond the individual farmer? Sure, um, I will, uh, I can answer those questions to the extent that uh, I am aware of uh, the details of the study that was not conducted by me or by the Valuables Consortium, but by Isaac Morrison's team and MSI International. Um, so my understanding is that the uh, value, uh, the per farmer value that was uh, estimated, the, um, the $80.47 uh, $80 of uh, reduced uh, damage to crops from frost, uh, thanks to the availability of the warnings, uh, is based on, on the surveys, uh, which... Um, of these uh, Kenyan tea farmers, and, and there were about 400 of these um, uh, farmers surveyed. Um, and so that the that numerical estimate comes from within um, those uh, farmers. Uh, they the authors of the report did uh, provide a sense of how widespread uh, these values might be across farmers. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there they uh, focused on the specific uh, information dissemination uh, system that would be used for um, for this tool and uh, for this community, it would be through uh, radio and through mobile phone. And their estimate is that uh, eight in 10 farmers in this community would, would obtain these warnings uh, through these media. Um, and so that kind of gives you a sense of uh, you know, how many of these farmers might um, experience uh, this level of benefit. Thank you very much. Let's turn for a moment to uh, Bob's presentation. Um, Bob, you were measuring, there are two questions. You were measuring the use of data through citations and, and formal documentation, which allows us to quantify things. Have you also looked, in addition to DOIs as a method to the use of author identifications, ORCIDs is just one example, and other means that would broaden your study? That's a great question, Jay. Thanks. And we have not started looking at the author identification yet uh, uh, that would be in, say, ORC IDs or other types of, of uh of uh, identifiers. Uh, and uh, another possibility would be for us to start looking at organizational ideas, IDs uh, that are associated with them or other types of uh, 
IDs that uh, might uh, give us um, richer information about these uh, data citations. But uh, yeah, we're hoping that uh, these areas will will mature and that authors, or well, I guess publishers, would actually start requiring authors to put in their ORC ID so that that information could be uh, captured. Uh, and uh, in that, uh, those kinds of cases, uh, then we could begin to look at how we might be able to uh, have the relationships between the authors that are using the data and the kinds of studies that are really using the data. So yeah, we're looking forward to these kinds of developments, and I appreciate you raising that issue, Jay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, Miriam, you you have looked at some very interesting studies, and and you've addressed certain communities. Um, how do you find interacting with people at uh, different socioeconomic levels in trying to create trust? You mentioned trust as one of your major items for the communities that you're working with and the extrapolation to other communities in Africa and beyond. Thanks, Jay. Um, I think I must say, to, in order to build trust, it's one of the things that actually um, prolongs the research that we do. I think in most instances, you'd find that you would actually have to engage people probably more than four times before they can actually st start relaxing and actually sharing some of the information with you. And there's also issues of uh, gatekeepers in most of the communities and even within municipalities looking at local government level. So there are hurdles that one needs to go through, but um, what I've been able to do was to try and identify um, key people within uh, the community or the local government who actually help, uh, who have, who, with whom we've developed a relationship, a working relationship, so that they're able to actually facilitate the process so and uh, help uh, with uh, um, preparing the, uh, or organizing the stakeholder engagements, be it workshops or interviews. But generally, it takes time to actually build trust and to get people to start participating in, in that manner, in a participatory uh, uh, process. Yeah. There's a, a question um, from Bill Tang, uh, which is, does socioeconomically meaningful imply near term? I want to pose that to the entire panel of speakers, um, and you're welcome, whoever you want to start. So. Is it a near-term issue? Miriam mentioned that uh, people didn't pay attention to long-term and therefore Bill's question is very relevant. Well, this is Bob again. Uh, so I, I would say that it's not just near-term. Uh, decision makers are uh, looking at studies and uh, the uh, studies that reference the uh, scientific data, and they're looking at the uh, long-term effects often uh, to see how uh, they might plan accordingly. Uh, city planners uh, and, and others, uh, regional planners uh, might have to uh, make uh, adjustments in terms of uh, the infrastructure that they're planning to develop and uh, how uh, the, uh, where the populations are located and how they might have to uh, think about uh, new locations, perhaps, uh, in, in some cases, for the long term. Thank you, Bob. The other panelists? Uh, sure, this is Yusuke. Um, I agree with uh, Bob that uh, for a benefit to be uh, socioeconomically meaningful, it doesn't necessarily need to be near term. Uh, Again, in the Valuables Consortium, we've defined a socioeconomically meaningful benefit as being one that relates to uh, people and the environment. Um, so as long as, as uh, the the impact, right, the benefit matters to someone, um, even if that someone is someone in the future, uh, you know, it, it's socioeconomically meaningful. Uh, I think the key here is to um, uh, 
you know, encourage everyone who is uh, developing information uh, or data or or models uh, with the goal of uh, generating uh, socioeconomic and meaningful benefits to uh, characterize, you know, the theory of change, right? So how how is it, even if, you know, if these benefits are to accrue in the future, how, how is it, what are the decisions that are made either today or in the future that are influenced by the availability of this information? Um, and, uh, you know, I think the, the, the three presentations that were um, given today uh, provide, um, you know, very different but complementary approaches to identifying uh, those links. Mm -hmm. uh, Miriam here. So just to add to what my two panelists have uh, said, I think I agree with them. And I think I would just want to add that I think in most instances, like in, our, in my case where people have other competing issues uh, uh, or social economic needs, there is need to really communicate well how their immediate needs will be met as well as the future, I mean, the long-term needs. Otherwise, for most people, it's mostly around the immediate needs where, and they don't think about the long-term uh, social economic benefits of the decisions or the actions that they take. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good, thank you. Uh, Miriam, there's another question. Are there programs that train locals to share the scientific information with their communities? How do you penetrate the community at a, a good depth? So uh, with the work that I've been doing with the South African Risk and Vulnerability Atlas, it has been mostly a one-way uh, communication way by most of the information has just been coming from the scientific elite towards the communities or the different users at, uh, at the local level. But now there is more uh, research and uh, more organizations who are looking at trying how we can best try and integrate some of the experiential knowledge that the communities would have and integrate it with the scientific information. So all the R programs currently happening, including uh, work that is being funded by our National Department of Science and Technology, on the indigenous knowledge systems to try and integrate information that is available uh, from the communities and that with the uh, scientific community. Thank you, Miriam. I have one final question. Uh, it's for you, Sake. You mentioned the natural experiment involved with Landsat data and then doing without the data and comparing it. What other natural experiments should we look for um, in particular, those willing to pay for data versus those not. Of course, you talked about one technique for economic analysis, and this question is relating to a second technique. Right. Um, so what's really nice about these natural experiments, and uh, I don't believe there are many of them. <laughs> it would take some uh, some. Uh, effort to identify when they occur, and you know, I think that was uh, one of the uh, great aspects of that particular uh, study is that is that the author uh, was able to find the special situation in which uh, their users of these Landsat data, right, these gold mining companies, um, but there were periods and regions in which the Landsat data were not available, uh, and the reasons for that lack of availability had nothing to do with the gold mining industry itself. Um, that's why it's kind of a natural experiment in the sense that uh, nobody kind of designed this experiment to happen where uh, the decision makers in some cases would be provided with the information and in other cases not. It just sort of happened and we can look retroactively at the performance of the gold mining industry in these different uh, cases when the information is available and when it is not available and compare their productivity. Um, and so, um, you know, perhaps other natural experiments could uh, be uh, exploited uh, for other uses of Landsat data, uh, where where the data about the productivity of uh, the different sector, other than the gold mining sector, for example, could be exploited. Um, but uh, certainly there are other approaches to, uh, you know, characterize these two worlds, right? The one with uh, information and one without. 
Um, and uh, the type of qualitative research that Miriam described is, is certainly one that uh, we try to use as well, where we try to extract the information from the users themselves you know, and ask them, what would you have done had the satellite data not been available? What actions would you have taken and what would have happened? Um, it's, uh, so I, it, it, a natural experiment is one of many uh, possibilities within the toolbox for uh, identifying the value of information. It sounds like a dialogue which will continue and be profitable. I'd like to turn the floor back to Aaron, but before I do that, I'd like to thank the three speakers for very informative presentations and hope that uh, you'll be open to dialogue in the future on this subject. Aaron, you're, you're on. Great, thanks so much. And I'd like to echo Jay's thanks to the panelists. I thought that the the presentations all really complemented each other well and that the questions at the end were pretty interesting as well um, and agree I'd like to continue the conversation. So to wrap up um, I'd just like to um, share that as Jay mentioned at the beginning this is a webinar series and the next two are planned so October 2nd November 15th we'll be having um, webinars with similar formats to this on specific topics related to agriculture and climate and then to um, disasters and data-driven decision-making in November and then December is still in the planning. Um, and as we mentioned as well, the, the these are recorded and they're available on YouTube um, and I will chat those links in just a minute. Um, so there are several ways to stay involved. Our next meeting is gonna be January 15th to 17th in person in Bethesda. Um, and there have been some recent publications here. And so we'll put those links all in the chat. Um, for everything here, but I'd really like to highlight um, the GeoValue uh, the GeoValue book. Um, so ESIP is in partnership with um, the GeoValue community with this webinar series, and there's a book um, that uh, Francois Perlman was one of the editors, and it just came out this past year. Um, there's also other literature on measuring the socioeconomic impacts, um, and there's a variety of things that are going on around the community, um, as well as the valuables community that we heard um, heard Yusuke talk talk about earlier in this webinar today. Um, so there are many ways to stay involved on this topic um, in particular. And with that, I'd just like to thank you. And I'd also like to acknowledge Arika Virpongzi, who is the overall coordinator for the series. Um, and has been working with ESIP, um, and she is currently out on maternity leave, but she'll be back in October. Um, but she did a huge amount of work to get this going as well. So with that, thank you everybody for joining us, and um, we hope to see you in October. <laughs>